what shocking thing did Jesus say in his hometown when he came back for his big debut? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 4. We kick off with Luke 4 being tempted and that Jesus was returning from the Jordan. So it shows the timeline of all of this and that he had been in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. We also know that he ate nothing, that he was fasting. It wasn't just that he was hungry and not eating because what's there to eat in the wilderness? I've seen the wilderness and I don't think there's anything to eat there. But he was fasting, which means that it was meant as a dedication to God. The purpose behind fasting and just hunger are a little bit different. Mark didn't even mention this, but Matthew did. And we're going to hear about it again. So again, the first time the devil tempts him, he says, hey, make yourself some food. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. This is ESV. It's a very condensed version of the temptations of Jesus. But The idea here is that we're not going to break God's will for us, go against God because of our bodily need, that we should not go against God for any reason, even hunger. Then Jesus takes them up and shows them the whole world and says, you know, take it. Take the glory that you were meant to have and everyone will worship you. And Jesus said that you should only worship the Lord your God. And that is the only person you shall serve. Jesus is not going to take, avoid what is going to happen in the last week and cut short our salvation. If Jesus did any of these temptations, we would not be saved. But we know he's not going to do it. And then the devil takes him to Jerusalem, the highest point of the temple, which was, again, supposed to be pretty tall and says, throw yourself down, knowing that the angels were going to pick you up and not let you hurt anything on your body. You know, and this is a glory movement, right? So the first one's hunger, bodily need. The second one is worldwide power. And this one is fame. Because if you fell in the temple courtyard and had a host of angels scoop you up before you fell, boy, everyone would listen to you. So this is kind of a fame thing. And he's like, we don't put God to the test. The devil left him. And this was kind of an interesting statement. It says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until the opportune time. And what in the world does it mean to say until the opportune time? Well, when you're going to look up something like this, this is a perfect example of using the Matthew Henry commentary because he goes through everything sentence by sentence, almost word by word. And what it says is, quote, He departs now till that season when the time of the devil is going to be in this world again. I think that the saying is the devil saw there's no use in being here while Jesus is here. But when this world is handed back over to the devil, he's going to come back and take rule or take charge of it. And that was something that was not said in the other Gospels. So then Jesus begins his ministry and he returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the report went out. Everyone was talking about what was going on in the surrounding countryside. And he taught in the synagogues and everyone was glorified. This ministry starts out with Jesus and we hear more about it. Jesus goes back then to Nazareth and that's where he was raised. And that's where his father's carpentry or craftsman shop was. He went to the synagogue on Sabbath. Because that's what you do, says according to the custom. He go to Sabbath. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him to read. So he unrolled it and found the place where it said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news, the gospel, to the poor. Again, whether you're poor in spirit, you're poor in money, or you're poor in power, you have no ability to control your life. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So obviously we know that Jesus is going to cure the blind, that he is going to heal the sick. The Lord of the year's jubilee was something that happened every 50 years. 
we kind of talked about that in Matthew's genealogy, that seven times seven was kind of a magic year. And Jesus would have then been the fulfillment of it because what happens in the 50th is debts, sins, obligations are forgiven. So if you were in servitude, and again, this isn't slavery like we think of slavery. This is, I would like to buy a plot of land. So I'm going to work for you for seven years. You will give me the money or you will give me that portion of land. And I work for you while I'm paying off that debt. People used to do this again to come to America. They couldn't afford the boat. So they would come work someplace here voluntarily because they went into this agreement, not knowing what it was going to happen. They would work off with time the money for the boat. So this, it was that kind of thing. But at the year of the Jubilee, all would be forgiven. All slaves would be free. All servants would be let go. This was a time for forgiveness. And so what we're saying now is, this is a different kind of jubilee. We're not talking about the money or the debts or any of that. We are talking about the payment for sin. Your sins, your debts are going to be paid by Jesus. He is going to end that debtedness of your soul to God. He is going to fulfill it. And so you can see that Jesus is not separating himself or ending Judaism. He has come here to fulfill everything that was meant to happen. He is coming here to be the Jubilee. He is not creating a new part of the scripture without settling the debts. And by him reading the scriptures, and in this particular case, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, that promises God's salvation. So it says he rolled up the scroll. I'm sure people were like, what? He just rolls it up the tube hands it back to the attendant and sat down. And then everyone's just looking at him like, what did you just say? Then he goes on. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they were, it says, marveled at his words coming from him. Hey, is that Joseph's kid? You know, like the like craftsman that used to live down on Third Street. I think it's harder sometimes for someone to hear something stunning from someone who grew up in your town then it is a complete stranger because you saw him trip in the playground. You know the kid. You've talked to him before. And so people were kind of stunned by this whole thing. And then Jesus said back to him, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician heal yourself. Do in your hometowns as well. I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I tell you the truth, that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, that means no rain, there was a great famine that came over the land. Elijah was sent out to none of them except for Zarephath from the land of Sidon. That's going to be in that Phoenician area in sort of the coastal north part of the land of Israel. So he went to a woman who was not of Israel. There's all these widows in Israel who were suffering because of this famine, but yet he went to a woman who was not of the people of Israel. There were a lot of lepers. There were the prophet Elisha. None of them were cleaned. But the only one who was cleaned, Naaman of Syria. And so when they saw that, they're mad, saying, look, God has sent people to save you. But you know what? In the end, it's the Gentiles who are going to be saved and, and cared to in this case. And so they're mad. Because they're the chosen people and you're choosing other people. You did this miraculous thing. You said this amazing thing. You said you were the fulfillment of salvation. And now you're saying it's coming to everybody. Everybody's going to get this. And so they tried to drive him out. But it said, by passing through their mist, he went away. I don't know if they like got fuzzy. Did he go invisible? Or were they just so enraged with anger? He was able to just walk right through them. Because they were going to throw him off the cliff, or what the ESV says, the brow of the hill. So he leaves, you know, that's the end of it. So he goes back to Capernaum, and he starts teaching, and this is the Sabbath, and we're going to see a lot of confrontations about Sabbath. And people mention that Luke kind of puts these together because he's building a lesson. You know, like I said, Matthew's fulfilling prophecy, but also telling us how we should live. Mark is instructing 
of people who want to know some action that Jesus did. In this case, Luke is crafting these stories together in an order for us to understand Jesus better. So he was teaching on the Sabbath. People were astonished. And that he had such authority. Remember, the Romans like that, too. He wasn't just some guy that says, well, according to Rabbi Hillel, this, you know, and then according to this letter that is mentioned in the Mishnah that we talked about, you know, handed down from generation to generation, he is saying, this is how the passage goes, talking with authority. And then there was a man who had an unclean demon and cried out in a voice, you know, that was basically, ha, which is mocking right there. You know, what do you have to do with us? Did you come to destroy us? We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Now, Jesus was not at that point where he was being open, at least as close to Jerusalem as they were, about his ministry. And Jesus says, shut up and come out of him. That's not exactly what Jesus said, but that's the intent of it. Then the demon threw him down and then came out of him, not harming the man at all. And everyone, again, was amazed what kind of man has this sort of authority to throw out an unclean spirit. So then the reports went out everywhere. Jesus trying to keep everything kind of quiet, and yet the word is getting out. It says that there are 21 miracles in the message of Luke, and this is the very first one. But this possessed man with the demons inside of him, they knew who Jesus was. You know, that's that's kind of the funny thing about it is that when you hear atheists say, you know, there was no God or there is no God, You know, the evil in the world, they know there is a God and they know that they're following not God. And so in this case, they understood that whole piece. So Jesus heals a lot more people and goes to the house of Simon. Simon is Peter. I also think it's kind of funny because we're going to see this in the other case too, that while we have Peter and Matthew, Luke calls them Simon and Levi. But he goes over to Simon's house and his mother was sick, as we know. They begged him, you know, please heal my mother. So he stood over her, rebuked the fever. You know, he rebukes devils. But in this case, he rebuked an illness and the fever left her. It says again, she immediately got up and started serving them. I think that's such a funny image. And in the television show, The Chosen, you see it too. She pops out of bed and and gives them all goat cheese to eat for lunch. So not only is she better, she's like back in action again. So that's kind of funny. So the sun had set and they had healed all the people with all the very different diseases they have and demons came out of people. And people said, you are the son of God. But he wouldn't allow them to speak because they knew, the demons knew, he was the Christ. He continues to preach in the synagogues. We've heard that in other gospels where he likes to go by himself into quiet places and he prays But, you know, the people, the crowd, they never let up from him. He said to them, I must preach the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God in other towns, too. I was sent here for that purpose. So he went going and preaching throughout Judea, this kind of idea. And that ends Luke 4. I'm going to meditate this week on when he went to Nazareth and how he was given the scroll of Isaiah to read. And yet they heard the word of Isaiah and didn't want to hear what it had to say. And we all get into that place where we don't want to be confronted with God's word, primarily because it's hitting a part we're sore about, whether we're not giving the money we should be giving, or we're not giving the faith and the trust we should be giving, or we're not forgiving others and showing others mercy. Whatever it is, we are sometimes confronted with a Bible passage that hits us in our core sin spot. and how. They got angry about it. So I'm going to meditate on how we can accept God's word in its totality, even when it might convict us to change our behaviors. And that's going to be my prayer for this week, is that I always listen to God's word with an open heart. I let it permeate my sin and the places where I'm stubborn, the places where I think I'm right, or the places where I'm hiding my own sin over there in that closet not doing anything about it. And what I'm going to share with other people is that Jesus did come here to proclaim the good news to the poor, the the powerless, or the impoverished in our world, and liberty for those who are captive, whether we're captive in sin, 
whether we're captive in other ways, he is telling us we are going to be free. We're going to regain our sight. We're going to talk more about sight as we get more into his gospel. And if we're oppressed, we're going to have liberty. Not just us, everyone. We may have things pretty good. There are people in this world who are oppressed, blind, and poor in their ability to change their lives. Jesus came for them too. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Also know that I'm on YouTube. The podcast automatically loads up to YouTube. It's not the prettiest channel you have in the world, but you can listen to every podcast there. Thank you for listening.